meow. Welcome to the podcast. This is my pod and I am Kat. I am worn out today, you guys. Um, I was kind of excited for my first field trip, which is I've been in quarantine for six days and I had to go pick up my paycheck today from work. So I was kind of like, oh, I'm going to get to go out, Um, which is scary, but also I was kind of looking forward to that. So I'm on my way to pick up my paycheck and a man stops me outside the library on my way in and he is Japanese. And he said, oh, excuse me, ma'am, I'm a Japanese reporter and I'm interviewing people. And I was extra like, oh, I, you know, I should talk to him because I know that it's difficult right now for Asian people facing uh, discrimination, particularly by leaders calling COVID-19 the Chinese virus. So I know that, I, you know, I should be extra polite. So I said, okay. And I tried to stay my distance, like six feet, but he kept getting closer and closer. And the whole time he's videoing me, which I didn't give my consent to. So he's asking me about how I'm doing, what's my job, what's my life. And I was like, you know, I, Hey, I do have to kind of get going. And I kept trying to make outs for myself and he kept going. And then he passed me a pen, which I didn't want to touch a pen and ask me to write down my information. And I always write fake information in those cases, but I still want to like be polite. And then he grabbed my arm, which like is never okay. So I ended up excusing myself and leaving, but I made me think of in Girl with the Dragon Tattoo when, um, without any spoilers, I'll just say the villain is confronting the hero and the hero totally just walks into the villain's house, even though he knows he shouldn't. And the villain says, why don't people trust their instincts? You know something was wrong, but you came back into this house. It's hard to believe the fear of offending can be stronger than the fear of pain. So the question that I want to ask the audience today is, um, is your need to be polite stronger than your sense of safety? How do you kindly but firmly set boundaries and how can you do it quickly, especially with strangers? Um, so we'll come back to that, but I want to introduce today's guest, um, my very, very lovely, cherished kitten, my good friend, Alexis. Hi, mama. <laughs> Hi, honey. Uh, who are you and where are you? So my name is Alexis Bailey. Um, I am in Colorado Springs and, um, I met Kat, um, in our sorority Alpha Delta Chi up in Boulder a couple years back. Yeah, which is the same place uh, Faith talked about that as well um, in our episode. So uh, what do you do where you live? Um, I am a high school teacher. I currently teach ninth and 10th grade English, and then I also teach a credit recovery English class for students who have failed a semester of English um, at any point in their high school career. Um, I also coach volleyball for my high school that I teach at, and... um, yeah, I'm a dog mom, too, and that's the best. <laughs> that is a very important part of our identity. Um, how have you been affected? What has been your school's response? And do you want to give us a brief timeline of where you're at now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we um, got word last Thursday, so on the 12th of March, that um, uh and current with all the schools in the Pikes Peak region and in the state of Colorado eventually, um, that we would be closed for at least two weeks. So um, we started last week just kind of like quick, uh, thrown into the fire kind of thing with an online learning process in our district. Um, there are a couple other districts in the springs that are doing this, but not a lot. Um, and it's been a challenge for sure because we had... Uh, we were notified on the night of the 12th, and then the morning of the 13th, we were um, back in school. Um, we had a full day of school, got to meet with all of our kids and kind of give them the rundown for what the next couple of weeks would look like. Um, and then starting Monday the 16th, we had full-on, uh, ready-to-go online classes and teaching online, um, which has obviously presented a challenge because none of us were ready for that. We had a kind of a weekend to prepare for it. Um but it's been okay so far. It's been different. I obviously did not get into teaching to teach online. I don't prefer that. I prefer face-to-face connections and contact with kids. And, um, you know, we're facing a lot of struggles with kids who maybe don't have, you know, uh, internet at home or they may not have access to a computer or a device or anything. And so, um, you know, trying to figure out ways to reach those students as well. Um, 
So then we luckily are on spring break this week. So the initial shutdown of two weeks for our school was uh, supposed to be last week, the 16th through the 19th with our spring break starting on Friday, uh, the 20th of last week. And we're on spring break this week. So we kind of all have an opportunity to rest and chill and take a minute, you know, away from the online learning. Um, but when we come back to school next Monday on the 30th, um, they, our school district has let us know that um, the th- the next three Mondays, so um, the last Monday in March and then the first two in April, are going to be devoted to kind of like online teacher training. Um, so we'll meet as staff virtually um, and kind of learn like what we need to be teaching online, how we're going to finish the rest of the school year um, online. Um, at this point, we're only closed um until April 17th, but there could be an extension just kind of based on how the rest of the country is responding right now. So um, it's been good. I'm definitely thankful for spring break right now to kind of take a break from my computer. And, you know, I, I think it's something I've, I've shared this with my family and friends. It's it's always a, a big milestone to make it to spring break as a teacher and as a student. And I feel like a lot of people aren't really celebrating that just because the times have been so crazy recently. So it's nice to kind of step back and, and just be able to, you know, kind of reflect on the year, get ready for the last quarter of the year and, and kind of go forward from there. So I'm enjoying spring break and I'll gear up, get ready to teach come next Monday. So, Well, I should mention that we are talking on Monday, March 22nd. I don't think, I'm sorry, 23rd, March 23rd, Monday. I don't think I mentioned that um, to help people with that timeline. But I'm amazed that you, it sounds like you guys have uh, really decent resources in place as far as, um, you are getting an actual spring break, which I love that you don't have to spend your, I know a lot of teachers are having to spend their spring break, putting everything online. So I'm glad you are given a rest as well as, um, it sounds like you guys are going to come together virtually and have instructions on how to put stuff online. Is there a platform that you're given? Yeah. So, so yeah, we, um, as a district prior to this school year, we kind of had the option to choose what sort of online tool we liked. Um, a lot of teachers that I know and what I learned in my first year was Google Classroom was a really reliable way to communicate with students. And that's what I got really comfortable with in my first year of teaching. Um, this year, our district is rolling out um, kind of like a pilot year of Schoology, which is um, a different online platform. It's a little bit more inclusive. It's got, you know, message boards. It's got the ability to post tests in, um, you know, right in Schoology. It's it's a really inclusive way, but <laughs> seeing as I just got comfortable with Google Classroom, I'm kind of hesitant to switch over to Schoology. So this year, a lot of teachers are kind of given the option of um, – you know, what, what platform they want to use. Some use Google Classroom, some use Schoology. Um, feedback that I've heard from students, they're not totally comfortable with Schoology yet either, so it's kind of a, a tricky time. Um, our administration is asking that we at least post everything on Schoology, but then we can continue. You know, if we share our Google Classroom link on Schoology um, and refer students to that platform as well, we can do that. But it's definitely a learning curve. We've had some trainings throughout the course of the year, but because it hasn't been mandatory for all teachers to use um, Schoology at this point, a lot of us have kind of just bypassed those trainings and said, yeah, I'll use it when I use it kind of thing. So now um, looking towards the end of the year, that puts students kind of in a funky spot just because, um, you know, they don't, for, for science, they may use Schoology, but for English, they may use Google Classroom. So it, it, I think that's probably what some of these virtual meetings are going to come back to is you know, allowing us to all get on the same page, make sure that we, you know, have a kind of streamlined path for our kids to be successful. And yeah, we'll go from there. I think it's going to be kind of a a day-to-day learning process for everybody, teachers, students, admin. I mean, this is new for everybody. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Well, it is amazing that we live in a time where technology allows for that. Um, I actually, my middle school years were online. I'd always homeschooled. And then through middle school, I took Florida virtual school, which was high school online. But, um, I had kind of been taking advanced classes at that point anyways. Um, my math was still regular age appropriate, but my English was a a little advanced. Um, so I had those classes, but that was what I signed on for. And I knew I was doing online and, (laughs) 
it wasn't a total uh, surprise thrown on me yeah. last minute. Yeah, and I think part of the challenge now, too, is, like, you know, how do you conduct a PE class online? You know, I've heard from mm. some of my students just through email this last week, you know, it's like they have a specific workout to do every week or, you know, but I, I think about kids that, um, you know, or maybe like a wood shop class or a, a 3D art class, you know, those things are kind of hard, especially if kids don't have the resources or the materials. And again, it's just, it's tough for the students who don't have internet access at home or, um, you know, they're, they're just in a place where they don't have the ability or the resources to get on the computer at this point. So, um, you know, that, I think that's part of also that the, those meetings coming up is just to figure out what, what exactly is going to, what, what is this all going to look like? Cause we have no idea. <laughs> I'm remembering back to, uh, I don't, I totally forgot about this, but I needed a PE credit in high school and I was a varsity swimmer for four years, which didn't count as a PE credit, which I was surprised by because band counted as a PE credit, which band is very labor intensive. I understand sure. why it yeah, was, but absolutely. Of four years of varsity sport, I was kind of shocked, wouldn't count towards something. So I needed one semester of PE and I didn't want to give up any of what I was taking um, as my electives. I was very involved with yearbook. So I took online swimming, which meant oh, wow. that I, it was through, I think it was through Big, Brigham Young University. I remember oh, my cool. high school counselor helped me find this where I could report weekly to an online course telling them what I had done as my workouts. And so I just kind of like, it was very self-regulated, very honor system. Um, you know, they say, Hey, make sure you're swimming. And I said, I'm doing that. Um, so I found that resource, but it is, I mean, it was kind of hilarious to be like, I could never get off my couch and just tell them I'm doing something. I couldn't believe it counted. I think that's one of the tricky parts of online learning too, is just, you know, the, the, we we talk a lot in school. I mean, especially me with my kids. I, I have freshmen, you know, and it's like that's a big year for learning how to manage high school and how to manage your responsibilities. And, um, you know, if, if we're lucky in any part of this, it's that they've had their first semester of school to kind of figure out how high school works. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of kids who still need, you know, that face-to-face contact or that motivation, like, you know, to get stuff done. And we have a lot of kids we're talking through, you know, issues with um, – you know, special education learners and what their, you know, modifications are going to look like or their adaptations to their assignments, um, you know, ESL kids that, um, English is their second language. Like, how are we going to adjust for those students? So I think it's, it's really going to be just like a trial by fire kind of thing. And and we'll just kind of try it out, see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, we'll adjust and move forward from there. Yeah, I guess you guys are doing the best you can, and teachers deserve yep. snaps and praises for making it happen because learning styles are so different. Like, I'm such a tactile learner. I have to actually hold the science experiment to understand it. And so, you know, like hearing a lecture, I'm not auditory. It's uh, difficult for me to process information that way. I'm kind of visual, but more than anything, until I think physically go through it. It's hard to understand it. And I think about college classes, like if you are, um, I mean, I was a film major and I had to literally process my film like through chemicals and you can't do that in your own home. So I'm like, I don't know what those kids are doing right now. Or, um, I mean, music majors would be kind of difficult if you're used to playing in a group or theater majors where you're very performative on a stage. Like it is not possible for everyone to be adapting right now yeah yeah and it's I think that you know I think each teacher is just going to kind of find what works for them you know like theater is a good you know a good thought just how do you run a theater course you know online it's I don't know it's and it's crazy because we are so um you know just as of like recent the push for um like inquiry based learning has been so big so it's not so much anymore education is sit and get you sit and take notes and and just take the take the message of what the teacher says you know like we're constantly being challenged to have our kids engaged and doing their own learning and their own thinking and coming up with questions that they would like to answer you know so that's i think a big piece of it too is um this obviously is not direct instruction anymore, but it's going to be a lot of, here's your assignment, do it, report back to me, which is, is kind of hard too. So we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the challenge. Like I said, I'm really, I, as a student, I 
very, very <laughs> much dislike online learning. I never liked taking classes online um, in college. I always opted for the in-person classes, but, you know, it's going to be a good challenge. And, and I think my biggest thing is going to be, you know, finding ways to um, – connect with students because you know I I love to stay after school and just have kids come by my classroom so we can sit and chat about their day or you know pulling kids into the hallway and saying how's it going checking in on them so you know kind of finding new ways um through technology to kind of get um you know whether it be a video conference with my whole class or you know something just to just to make sure that kids are doing well and checking in on them so Absolutely. And I think that leads to my next uh, thing I wanted to get your feedback on, which was um, age appropriate discussions with children. So you are teaching 14, 15 year olds, ninth and 10th graders. But I'm thinking about when I was nannying and I was watching a six year old and nine year old and uh, the Sandy Hook shooting happened and the parents texted me of the children that I was picking up from school and they said, don't tell them anything. And I was like, okay, uh, I'm sure they've heard it by now, but maybe not. And so I picked them up and I had to just go about my nanny day regularly, which I wouldn't discuss with a six-year-old or a nine-year-old anyways that aren't my children. But I remember the parents then coming home and saying, hey guys, how are you doing? And then pulling me aside and going, we're not going to talk to them about this. And we appreciate if you don't either. And I was like, okay. Um, Again, not something I would have discussed with kids I'm nannying anyways, but it was interesting that they chose uh, not to put that fear into their children. So I'm wondering about, obviously you have teenagers, um, but like if you have any input on age-appropriate discussions for people to be having right now with kids, because kids are so spongy, they know what's going on, even if you don't think they do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, that was one comment that, you know, we, my, uh, teacher that I share a classroom with in my building, you know, we kind of had that conversation. Um, you know, a lot of kids were like, what is this shut? You know, before we left school, they're like, what is this shutdown? Like, why are, why aren't we coming back to school? And it kind of shocked me that some kids didn't know, what was going on. Um, and I think it shocked me because they're constantly glued to their phones. You know, like that's one of the biggest problems that I face is, um, you know, put your phone away, make sure you're paying attention in class, that kind of thing. And so it's for your students to not know, you know, but I guess it, it kind of depends on the platform, you know, that they're on as well. If they're on Instagram and following their friends, they're not necessarily going to be following the news and that kind of stuff. So, um, we had a lot of conversations about that, very early on just kind of you know what what do we talk about with kids and how do we phrase this and you know when kids say when do I get to see you again like how you know how do you respond to that and I think like I said too because this was such a quick thing like we were notified on a Thursday night and Friday was our last day of school you know it was we didn't even know we thought we'd be out of school for two weeks now we're out for almost a month from the date that they called it and so you know not getting to even just like tell our kids, hey, well, you know, we may not see you again this school year or, you know, anything like that. It was, we'll see you when we see you kind of thing, which was really tough. But one of the biggest pushes that we had um, right at the uh, the last day on, on Friday, um, March 13th, was the one thing that our administration pushed out to us to push to our students was a list of um, places where they could get food. So that was one of our biggest things. And then a list of places for mental health counseling. Um, and it didn't, they didn't instruct us anything about instruction or curriculum or anything like that, but those were the two base things. And <clears throat> they asked us to post, you know, that list of resources for like um, hotlines and counselors and, you know, our counselors at school sending out their phone numbers and email addresses and stuff like that. And, you know, I think that that was an effort to, you know, protect our um, culture of our school, protect our our kids, um, make sure that families are, you know, receiving the resources that they need. Um, But also, I think it's one of those things where not to say they say leave it to the professionals, but it's like, hey, we've got, you know, a team of people that are really, you know, ready and willing to talk to students about, you know, stress at home or why is this happening? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to be affected by this? Um, you know, so really I think at at the, at the age of the, the students that I teach, um, a lot of them are aware 
either through social media, through interactions with friends. Um, I feel like there are at the age where parents can have kind of like those open and candid conversations with them. Um, And had we had a little bit more warning about our school closing, I probably would have had some more conversations with my kids about what we knew or what was going on. But like I said, it was such a quick turnaround that those conversations um, didn't really happen. So it's, uh, I think it's hard to navigate. Um, Like I said, one of my favorite things about my job is really getting to connect and like get one-on-one with kids and have those conversations about life and boys and struggles and stress and, you know, just everything, um, that a young man or woman goes through and, um, you know, not being able to have those regularly is, is kind of difficult. So knowing that they have an outlet or a resource, um, with some of my volleyball girls that I coach, um, I've already made an effort to text them and just say, Hey, you know, do you want to FaceTime this week? Or, um, you know, text me if you need me, kind of started a group chat with some of my players. So, you know, an effort to reach out and say, like, I'm here for you guys. I don't know what you need. I don't know when you'll need it. But if you need anything, let me know. So, I've, you know, I've had a couple of cool FaceTimes with some girls that I guess didn't know that they needed a FaceTime. But when it came down to it, they were like, that was super helpful, you know, just to even talk about how life is going and how it's going being cooped up at home with mom and dad. And, you know, so um, I, I I wish I had a better answer as far as like what, um, what is age appropriate, but if anybody knows the answer to that, I would, I would like to know as well. (laughs) About like what, what's age appropriate for me? What can I handle? (laughs) It's scary for everyone. But I do, I mean, some, I was listening to, I'm still finishing out Michelle Obama's book Becoming and Mm -hmm. she was just talking about, um, the difference, like they've done studies, the difference it makes on students, teenagers of their, I mean, even like their school improvement when they have another adult who cares about them. So having adult, an adult check in outside of their parents who says, Hey, your success matters to me. And that so often comes from a good teacher or a good, you're a volleyball coach who cares about the the students as people, not just as players. And yeah. so having that extra adult in their life that checks in, um, like factually <laughs> makes a difference. Um, but I was thinking about my favorite podcast is good mythical morning. Rhett and link are two friends they are in their forties. They have a YouTube show called good mythical morning and they have a podcast called ear biscuits. And at the beginning of this year, they kind of, um, came out about their struggle with uh, religion, and um, they used to be very evangelical Christian, and now they're very open-ended. So without going into that, they did say that um, for their kids, they used to say, hey, I'm the authority, here's the answers. And now they kind of say, hey, I don't have the answers, what do you think? And they kind of talk it over, and they're talking about how like that actually might be helpful for kids. First of all, I mean, kids need to know that they have someone who's going to take care of them and a safe place. But I think it's really alarming when you grow up and you realize like, hey, these these adults told me that they knew all the answers and I'm an adult and I don't know all the answers. Am I unprepared? And we don't have the answers on anything. And so I guess as far as age appropriate, that varies from kid to kid even. But we don't, know the answers we don't know what's going to happen we hope we're going to be okay and that's the best we can do but kind of being honest with your own children don't do this with other kids Um, but if you're a parent you know kind of having a a family dynamic of like well we can talk about things and if we're scared about things it's okay even mommy and daddy and whoever get scared um that might be more comforting than being like, well, when you grow up, it's all going to be laid out and. (laughs) Well, and I think that's one of the, one of the things too, that, you know, has kind of hit me this week. I am a person, I watch the news every day. Like when I first wake up in the morning, I turn the TV on and that's kind of how I wake up. When I go to bed, I watch the 10 o'clock news. Like I, I just like to be informed. I love the news, um, especially like just local news, national news, whatever it is. Um, And I, this week, for the first, like, three or four days that we have been off of school, I was glued to the TV. I was constantly watching. And it was, like, 
you know, you can take what you want from it. It's going to, some it's going to be positive. Some of it's going to be negative, but there came a day yesterday. I literally, I didn't turn on the TV all day. And that's like not a normal thing for me. I usually always just have it on in the background with the news running. And I just couldn't do it yesterday. I had to turn it off just as a way to kind of like exist and say, we don't know. They don't know. The experts don't know, you know, like we wish they did know. And we wish that this would kind of speed up and get out of this, this process that we're in right now. But you know, I had to kind of just sit back and say, I I can't control it. Me yeah. sitting in front of the TV is not going to make anything better. It's going to yeah. give me some information, but it's also, you know, it's also a little bit alarming and scary sometimes. Like you said, you know, mommy and daddy might not have the answers all the time yeah. either. So it was just one of those things where I was like, yeah, I'm done with the news today. If something big comes on, I'll get an alert on my phone. But besides that, we're done. <laughs> we're done with the news for today. So I think it's okay to, you know, like, that's one of the biggest things that we tell our kids is like, it's okay to feel, you know, if you're scared, feel scared, you know, and then we'll talk about ways to manage it. Or if you're upset or if you're mad, or if you are, you know, whatever you feel it's justified and it's real, but then we have to figure out a way to face it and kind of move forward with it. And I, I feel the same way, you know, this has so much uncertainty going on through it right now that who knows what's going to happen next, but we just kind of got to roll with it and respond accordingly. So Absolutely. News fatigue is very real. And uh, I listen every day to NPR when I drive to work. And I haven't been driving to work the last six days because I'm self-quarantined. Um, and today I had to go pick up my paycheck. So I had on NPR and I was like, okay, news, come at me. And it started to get really stressful really fast. But I was like, well, these are important. Th-. They were talking about what's going to happen with the Olympics and those mm-hmm. sorts of things. So I was like, I'm glad to be informed, but uh, clenching my teeth. And then they had someone on there who was not news related. They just were telling people like how to meditate. And he was just kind of a calming guy telling people, hey, here's a meditation. And I was like, thank you, NPR, for having balanced <laughs> stories and not just and that's that's what I like um I mean I whatever your news source is I try to read a few different um viewpoints but um whatever your source is it's nice to have um more than just I mean NPR has uh wait wait don't tell me and they used to have Prairie Home Companion and Car Talk and those sorts of extra shows (laughs) that are news adjacent um so that you're not just um um, one of my guests, Nova, gave a resource for um, the coronavirus dashboard. It's ncov2019.live, and that has, like, quick facts. Here's the total confirmed cases. Here's the countries it's in, this and that. So if you just want the numbers yourself, you can look at that um, and take from it what you will without too much extra doom. Yeah, Add yeah. In. That's what I've been looking for lately. Is just you know, give me the numbers, tell us where we're at, and let's move on. <laughs> totally. Well, I wanted to ask um, a little bit from you about having your life planned a certain way, and then having to adjust your expectations as it kind of swerves in a different direction. And yeah. um, if you wanted to speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I grew up in Colorado Springs. Um, I had every intention of leaving Colorado Springs when I was uh, graduating, moving on to college, and uh, settled on CU. And part of me is extremely thankful for CU for bringing me people like you, for sure, and, you know, some good experiences along the way. But um, ultimately, my life went a completely different direction than I thought it would. And um, when I graduated, I graduated high school in 2011 um, and then went up to Boulder, Um, in September of my first year of college, um, was diagnosed with a really, really, really bad, um, anxiety disorder, essentially. Um, I had never really experienced anxiety in my life prior to that. And, you know, when I got up there, um, growing up as an only child and then having to kind of navigate this world, uh, A, without my parents, but B, with like thousands and thousands of people that I didn't know, didn't trust, didn't, you know, have relationships with, um, it was kind of a big shock to me. So, um, that first semester of school, you know, it, it, it hit hard. It was not what I was expecting, um, at all coming from, you know, being somebody very involved in my high school. I was in student council yearbook, you know, I did the whole nine. I had a lot of great friends. I was, um, on, 
you know, involved in athletics and club volleyball and all sorts of stuff. And then to go to see you where you're one of thousands and thousands, um, and not really knowing your place or, you know, um, people even just to make connections with, um, it was a bit of a newsflash for me. So in, um, February of the next year, 2012, so I, I made it through the first semester barely, I will say, um, you know, constantly, you know, going up to stay with my cousin for a sense of security and safety, um, coming home, which was always a good thing, but made it way harder to return to school when I didn't feel comfortable. Um, you know, I started seeking counseling. Um, I was in group therapy. I was in, um, one-on-one counseling with a really great counselor at CU. Um, I was put on medication. I had never been on any form of medication before. I was put on three different meds that year to manage my anxiety. Like my life just, I was like, I don't even know who I am, honestly. (laughs) Um, you know, so I made it through that first semester, God willing. Um, second semester found, um, you guys with AD Kai and that was a big help. Um, but ultimately in February of that year, I had the worst anxiety attack that I've ever had to the point where I called it quits. I said, I'm done here. I need to, you know, return to a safe place. And I moved back home to the Springs. Um, I have always been extremely driven and focused on school. That has been, you know, I've been a great student all through my life, really enjoyed school, loved it. And at this point I was withdrawing from classes. So, to anybody who, you know, school is their life, essentially, to go your whole childhood into your first year of college and then not have school, um, I felt like I didn't have a purpose, like I didn't, you know, I like I said, I didn't know who I was, um, but ultimately made that decision to kind of return to a place that felt safe to me, continue seeking mental health support, um, and if I would not have returned home, um, I you know, I, I, I constantly think about how many different directions my life could have gone, you know, had I gone to CSU instead of CU or had I not gone to school at all, or, you know, all these different things, like what my life would have looked like. And of course we can't plan for those things. You know, we just kind of talked about that, but coming home, um, my life was a million times better than I ever could have predicted. So that day I moved home, I'm like, I'm a failure. I'm worthless. I'm this and that. I mean, my, I was, I was mad at myself and I was, I was so down in the dumps. Like, what do I do with my life? You know, nobody moves home from school. Like if, you know, if you do that, you're a failure. And of course that has come to be something that I'm a huge advocate for. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, you try something out and if it's not the right fit, then move on, find something new that works for you. And thank God for that because, um, you know, I, I landed my dream job here in the Springs. I never would have pursued education had I not come back home. I never would have found coaching, um, you know, and I'm in my almost eighth year of coaching now, and that just brings so much joy to my life. I never would have bought a house. I bought my first house at 22 years old, um, and I never would have found my dog, <laughs> and he's my world, you know. So there are so many things where I had my life set in stone and I knew what I wanted and I knew what I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. And then to have one night just flip all of that upside down, you know, to thinking that my life is over, I'm a failure, I'm worthless, to now being, you know, the happiest I've ever been. It's a pretty cool thing. It's terrifying. Um, you know, there were a lot of days of doubt and, and stress and worry. Um, but to look back on it all, um, you know, it was, it was all meant to happen for sure. So. Well, I thank you for sharing your story here. I think it's incredibly relevant to this. I do think when you go to college, that's the most stressful thing is that you're told these are the best years of your life and that you're like, everyone else is having a great time. Right. And then like you see, I remember myself reaching out to friends from high school and then being like, it's so much fun. And me being like, oh yeah, no, totally same here. And like (laughs) being by myself in a dorm room playing with a slinky on a Friday night being like, I don't want to go party. (laughs) Where are my people? Yeah. And that was part of it too. You know, my mom was a CU grad. Um, My dad started off the school at CU. He he eventually came home because he found um, his forever job here, um, in kind of land development. And so he, <laughs> he was like, why go to school when I can just, you know, continue working. But, you know, it's, so it was, to me, it was, well, my mom did it. My dad did it. Like, why can't I do it too? You know? And, and all the things mm-hmm. my mom had told me about how great CU was. And of course that was in the eighties. <laughs> and so, you know, times change. I am 
definitely a, a different personality than a lot of my friends. My friends were enjoying college, you know, like crazy. Um, you know, same thing. Like I was laying in my dorm room watching Say Yes to the Dress for hours on end because that's what was comfortable to me. And I felt like I was missing out and and all this stuff, you know. So it, it, I think it's, uh, you know, it should be the best years of your life. And for me, it was the worst years of my life to, to eventually lead me to the best years, you know? So it was, it was a blessing and a curse all in one and had to go through some stuff, you know, totally. to kind of find my place, which was, which ended up being a very good thing. Uh, yeah. Comparison is the thief of joy. And the Absolutely. truth is everyone else is not okay. <laughs> and it really feels like it, especially when, um, you don't want to be like, Hey, I'm struggling because you don't want to be a burden to your friends. And that's what it can feel like when you reach out sometimes. Um, but a lot of times it kind of like is a sigh of relief. Like I have had, um, just, I've probably been on the phone five and a half hours every day, like the last six days, like I just, I'm talking to everybody and the conversations I've had have been people who are like, Hey, I too have been depressed for a really long time. And this has kind of been a wake up for me. And, um, you know, I'm going to make good of my life now, or people have been like, this has made it worse. Um, so it's just the conversations I've had with people have been really, um, treasured this, this past week in such a weird way. Cause you're like, how do you talk about the future right now? Like, right. it's hard to be like, oh, and what are you looking forward to? Yeah. Um, but yeah, and that's, that's something else, too, real quick, just so, you know, yeah. we're on that topic. Um, you know, being a high school teacher, um, this is senior season. So we've mm-hmm. got prom, we had senior luncheon, we've got graduation, like all of these big question marks, you know, and like you said, looking to the future. It is so hard to have conversations with students. I mean, it, it, it just sucks. It's terribly, terribly difficult to talk to kids and say, I don't know if you'll get to graduate. I don't know if you'll get to experience your senior prom. I don't know if you'll get to walk the halls one last time. You know, a lot of the kids have, have reached out and said, like, I may have just walked the halls of our school for the very last time, and I don't know how to deal with that. You know, so it's one of those things where, like you said, having those relevant conversations with kids, like how do we talk to seniors about, you know, you think back to like how I, I enjoyed it. I was one of those kids who never wanted to graduate high school. But, I loved high you know, school. <laughs> yeah, some people I loved like, it. Get out of here. But, you know, for those kids who, who really just um, thrive in that setting, they've got great friends, they've, you know, built up what this senior season is going to look like for the last four years, if not longer. And now we're sitting at home, you know, guessing are we going to be able to have a prom and are we going to be able to watch you? get your diploma, you know, it's just crazy to think about all of the unknowns at this point and just the uncertainty. But then again, you find the joy in it. And, you know, once it's all done, we do get to celebrate and, and, you know, find, find the happiness in it. So, yeah, that's, uh, Faith and I, um, after our episode, we chatted for a while about her hope that people hug each other longer after this. And that when you do have, time with people that you put your phone down and give them your undivided attention and that we really value those connections. Um, but that's the reason I asked my question to you the way I did, which was you had your life planned a certain way and then you had to really adjust it, uh, totally without your uh, consent. You didn't want things to go that way. And then you had to really adjust to a new reality. But I think that that is what's causing a lot of anxiety right now is like the longer we, it's like, I mean, frankly, when uh, someone dies, I had a pet die last year, and it's like every morning when you wake up and you're like, oh, yeah, that's my reality. Like having to constantly relive that and the the more you resist it and the more you're like, no, no, I'm in the wrong universe. No, no, I need to get back to that that reality is going to cause a lot of internal strife. And so I think the quicker that we can say, well, we didn't want it. We really, really didn't want it. But this is our reality. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that's been, you know, something that I am, I would say that I am, I'm an, I don't know if I'm an introvert or an extrovert. I think I'm an outgoing introvert is what I like to call myself. But, Mm -hmm. you know, so having people tell me you have to stay home and lock yourself in your house. Okay, no problem. I would gladly do that any day of the week, you know, so that's a good thing for me. But you know, then I'm like, where are my students? Where are my family? You know, I have, my mom's a nurse. And so we're even keeping our distance. I haven't been able to see her for a couple of days. And that's, that's a weird thing, you know? So 
I think facing it and, and kind of just saying, yep, this is it. And how am I going to respond to this? You know, I've started journaling recently. Um, and one of the things that during this time specifically just last week, you know, I divide my page in half in my journal and I say, here's the anxiety that I have today. You know, my anxiety of, I hate that my mom has to go to work and be exposed to this, but in the other column of my paper, what am I going to do to overcome that anxiety? You know, so I hate that mom has to go to work, but then on the other side of it, I know that mom is living the purpose that she's supposed to live in caring for people. Or, you know, another example would be an anxiety that I face is, you know, um, I'm not getting able, I'm not, I'm not able to, you know, um, hug my students on, you know, their way out the door or I'm not getting able, you know, being able to, um, like, I don't know, have those one-on-one conversations. But then again, another way to combat that is, you know, FaceTime with my students or my, or my players or, you know, things like that. Um, not being able to have our weekly girls night when we go play volleyball together, but now we're doing lunch date FaceTimes, you know? So I feel like I've been able to find little bits and pieces of, of, you know, how to maintain my normalcy. It's not normal. Nothing is normal (laughs) right now, but, um, you know, if we're able to kind of see things through, okay, I can't have it the way I want it right now. What am I going to do about it? You know, how do I respond to this? The teacher that I I, I, uh, share my classroom with, he is a a veteran teacher of many years. He is one of the wisest men I've ever met. He's super cool. Um, And he has shared with me, this is a really cool deal. So on our whiteboard in our classroom, he has the letters E plus R equals O. And that means the event plus, so E plus R, um, plus your reaction equals the outcome. So whatever event happens, how are you going to react to it? That's what the outcome is going to be. And I've been kind of replaying that in my mind recently is, you know, here's our event. We can react to it however we're going to react, but that's going to ultimately come, you know, that's going to define our outcome. So if we're set on a certain outcome, you know, if I want normalcy, I then have to change my reaction, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's just been kind of a cool mental, um, mental thing to think through is like this, I'm, I'm in charge of very little right now, but what can I control that Mm. is going to make me feel okay and feel comfortable? Yeah. My family's catchphrase is always perception is reality and how you perceive things. And I mean, even going back to like, you can all have this, I loved high school. (laughs) It's so much fun. And then I'll talk to my high school friends who are like, I hated it. And I'm like, what? We were having so much fun, but it's like how you perceive things and you're saying you're how you react to things. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Well, and I, I, I saw a good thing that was um, stop asking for normalcy and instead ask for a better future. I'm not saying it well, but they were saying yeah, yeah. stop saying, you know, let's go back to the way things were because obviously the way things were, were was bad in that we didn't have enough hospital beds. Like we yeah. are not valuing our medical care providers. And then those of us who are hourly, like one little trip and we're like in a pit right now. So yeah. start saying, how can we build things better after this? Yeah. Um, but you started to answer my next question, which was, um, so many people right now. Um, I was just talking to a friend who, She was visiting her boyfriend back before we were all sheltered in place here in California, and his roommates are kind of experiencing panic attacks, and um, they've never had that before, and the uh, sudden (laughs) shift in, I want this normal, it's not that way, is really causing a lot of anxiety, and I was wondering if you have any coping strategies, and I know you mentioned the journaling thing, I love that. I know there's certain breathing things that people recommend. Yeah, so actually, um, when I was up in Boulder, and the first counselor that I saw up there, and again, I would, you know, obviously, (laughs) going to seek a counselor right now is probably not going to happen, but I would suggest this, I would say, once you get anxiety, it's kind of a thing and it sticks with you. Um, I just recently started seeing a counselor again and it's mostly, you know, like I'm doing great right now, but it's mostly just to have somebody comfortable that you can talk to and, um, you know, just kind of keep you accountable for your thoughts and things like that. So once this is all said and done, I would suggest absolutely reaching out to somebody that can kind of help you manage those things. But in the time being, um, one of the counselors that I spoke with up at Boulder, um, in those moments of panic and freak out and stress when you're like, I have no control over anything right now. Um, one thing she taught me to do is like a finger squeeze. Um, and what you do is you grab each finger, um, one by one with the other hand and you squeeze as tight as you can for 10 seconds. 
Um, and then you let go and you move to the next finger. And that kind of makes you have this like mind body connection. Like I am in control. I'm telling myself to do this and I'm responding. So I'm here. I'm good. You know, I can kind of maintain that like physical being, um, Another thing is kind of like an eye movement technique. And so you go to go around and you find something in the room that you're sitting in, something I can see, obviously could be anything. Something I can touch might be like a fuzzy blanket next to you or something like that. Something that you can hear. I can, um, you know, there's a wind chime out my window and I can hear a wind chime, you know, things like that, that make you feel kind of connected with the outside world. Um, and it kind of, kind of takes you on this, like, uh, distraction, like a self distraction that you don't really know that you're yeah. doing. Yeah, I've um, heard of that for really grounding, cool. like saying, you know, because you can't force mindfulness, but I have heard of that of saying, hey, five, five things that you can see, four things that you can yep. hear, three things that you can smell. Um, maybe don't be tasting anything right now, yep. but <laughs> that's sort of like putting yourself back in this room and existing in this space, especially if yep. you are starting to deal with depersonalization or something, which yeah. that's a heavy thing. We could talk about that on a different yeah. podcast, but if you're, if you're kind of, uh, losing the experience of being grounded in your body, I've heard that that was helpful. And then I want to get back to what you were saying, but the last thing I wanted to quickly throw in is, um, I have a friend, uh, John Reeves, who's a counselor and he was talking about like, you can do online therapy right now. So he's a therapist and he is having to go online and he was saying, you can still talk to and should talk to your therapist. And yeah, it's a, not a, it's, it's a really good time to look for, um, uh, he was calling it teletherapy, which okay. I assume me, I don't know if that means telephone conversations or Skype or something. Um, but that, is a big thing for people where they're like, Oh, it's not financially possible for me right now, or it's a luxury. But a lot of times after people go to therapy, they're like, wow, that was a necessity, not a luxury. Yeah. And, yep. and, and that's what I found too, is it's, it's worth it. It is pricey mm-hmm. here and there. It depends, you know, like if you find somebody in insurance or not, but once you come out of it and once you find somebody that you can really trust and talk to, it's like, okay, that's worth it. Like I can yeah. cut my weekly coffee expense for, you know, I can, I can throw that into my budget. It, it's definitely, I, I would highly suggest it. Well, and you probably are going to, if you're like a happier, healthier mental person in a, a, a mentally healthy space where you can go after your dream job, you're going to make more money. Like it will come back to you a hundredfold if you yeah. invest in yourself. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've heard of a breathing technique for helping with panic attacks of like, uh, five seconds in, hold your breath for seven seconds, five seconds out, so like just yeah. mindful breathing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That was one thing too, um, that I learned up in Boulder was, um, I actually had tapes that I would, or CDs, not tapes, <laughs> CDs that I would plug in and listen to plug my headphones in. And, mm. um, it would kind of give you like a, a, a rhythm or a beat at which you would follow along and breathe with. Um, it also kind of comes, I've heard of like with the tapping, like more physical. And I guess that's what's maybe helped me more is just that physical feel. Like, like you said, you know, feeling like you're existing in the space that you're in. So as well, you know, in addition to breathing at a certain pace and at a certain rate, you know, tapping along with that to count or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I know they make apps for it now, you know, the breathe app is a thing and, um, um, you know, there are different things that you can find online to, to breathe along with, which is pretty cool. So, um, this is like a whole big wormhole and I know we're going to wrap up, but, um, I, I don't know if anyone knows about ASMR, which is auto sensory meridian response. It's like these videos on the internet. I find them on YouTube where people will like tap on objects or there's yeah. like <laughs> role plays where they'll be like, I'm putting on your makeup. There's like weird stuff. So be careful what you get into. Yeah. But I personally really like the ones where it's just, um, uh, for me, it's very calming if it's a woman because I, I really trust uh, women. That's a, a personal thing for me. So if I find a woman who has just like a calming voice and she's just kind of like tapping on things, there's nothing um, uh, more soothing than like being back in the womb and just kind of like <laughs> listening to chimes. So ASMR is something that I personally – like I have insomnia problems. So for me, falling asleep – outside of this, just in my life, I've had yeah. to do that before. Um, kind well, of as I'm going to sleep. Is like the music that they play in like a spa or yeah. during a massage, you know, mm-hmm. those kind of like just, um, you know, just 
yeah. music without lyrics, I guess. Instrumental music is, is always a little bit mm-hmm. calming to me. So Yeah, and a lot of times I'm like, I can't afford a makeover or a spa right. day. And so this ASMR videos for me are very like, oh, they're pretending like I'm at a spa. And yeah. then honestly, like go, doing that a lot, made me um at the end of last year be like you know what I do think I actually want a spa day and I like got a massage for the first time in my life um so having that sort of like investing in self-care makes you invest more and as you have a relationship with yourself you like yourself more and you want to love yourself more and then you can love others better because if you can't love yourself how the (laughs) heck you gonna love somebody else (laughs) Um, cool. Well, I really appreciate all of, um, what you've said today. I, I, if nothing else, it's helpful for me. And so I, I love that. Um, was there anything I didn't get to that you wanted to mention to people or any, um, resources that you want people to know about right now? Oh gosh, I don't think so. You know, I think the biggest thing in all of this and, and I've kind of learned this through like things that I'll share, just, you know, reposts on Facebook or anything, there have been some comments that I've heard from people, you know, I'll share a post about like something that has like 50,000 shares or comments or whatever, where it's talking about a teacher missing their kids, you know, and Mm -hmm. and another teacher will comment, well, you don't miss your kids any more than I do, or, you know, you're not struggling financially any more than we are, you know, and it's, I think it's one of those things right now where it's, we're all in this, like there is, there is nobody that's exempt to the stress of what this is causing. Um, There is nobody that's living life a lot better, you know, than anybody else. I think it's, it's just one of those things. And I had this conversation with one of my volleyball players the other day. She said, she texted me and she was like, you know, our club season is canceled. I am so worried about school season and I'm going to get so behind in my skill because I'm not able to play. And, you know, I, I'm really stressed about tryouts and I'm like, first of all, chill, relax, you know, like we're very far out from that. But second of all, tell me what other player that you're competing against is not going to get behind. Like, this is not just a you thing. If you were sitting out being lazy, yeah, you would get behind, but guess what? Everybody is going to get behind. Everybody is is missing out on the opportunity to be in the gym, you know? So I think it's the same thing that applies to all of us. Like, you know, there are people filing for unemployment right now, friends of mine, you know, and it's, it's tough because they're, they're struggling to do that and they're struggling to pay bills. But it's like, you know, the, the okay thing, it's not a good thing, but the okay thing about all of this is that it really is affecting all of us. So there just needs to be some grace, um, you know, in how we, how we approach each other, how we talk to each other, just, we're all, we're all in it together, you know, so finding the best way to kind of navigate it, um, I think is, is going to get us through a little bit quicker. So I appreciate you calling and talking and everything. I, I hope I answered some of your questions. Totally. Yeah, no, Uh, this was, this was really good. And it is nice just to have a chat with a friend. Um, but yeah, that's been my saving grace right now of mental sanity is like, Hey, everyone's like losing their ish right now. So you know what? (laughs) It's, it's not unique to a problem that I have to solve. I just have to get through in any way I can. Um, do you have any recommendations for books or movies or, uh, TV shows that people can check out while they're quarantined and bored right now? Gosh. Um, you know, I, I don't off the top of my head. Um, I just picked up, um, a book, you know, and that's what, that's a really cool thing about this. I'm usually one of those people that's like, Oh my, you know, finishing my master's in December. It was like, I never have time for anything except homework and sleep, you know? Mm -hmm. So, one of the cool things about this now, I feel like this is God saying, Hey, you have a break, like take advantage of it, chill, be at home, be present with your, you know, be intentional with your conversations, you know? So I'm kind of taking this as like a life telling us to slow down and and enjoy the good things right now kind of thing. Um, one of which is I have a bookshelf full of books upstairs that I have not touched in God knows how long. Um, and one of them that I picked up that I got for Christmas a couple years ago is girl, wash your face by Rachel Hollis. Um, (laughs) I read the first two chapters of it last night and it's, you know, it it may not be for everybody, but it's, it's got some real stuff in it that I'm like, holy cow, didn't think about that. You know, if nothing else, it's just an eye opener to say, you know, what of this can I apply to my life and, and what little things do I maybe need to focus on a little bit more? So I'm not all the way through it. Um, I could have a different recommendation when I finish, but at this point, that's what I'm looking at. I'm doing a lot of coloring. I'm doing a puzzle, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to stay off of technology just to kind of give myself a mental break from all of that and, and, you know, kind of challenge myself in other ways. But, um, 
I would love recommendations if anybody else has yeah. got any. So. so you said Girl, Wash Your Face by Rachel Hollis. I always see yeah. that one advertised at Target as like a, a hot book that people are yeah, into. Yeah, and I've had a lot of friends that, that have read it, and they are just completely crazy about it, and they love it. And it's a quick read. I'm, like I said, I'm a, slow, I'm a slow reader, and I read the first two chapters and you know, a night. Um, so it's a quick one, but it's, it's definitely got some good reminders in it. I'm going to pass it on to my mom next. So, um, yeah, I've heard some good feedback on it. My sister likes the show on Netflix, making it with uh, Nick Offerman and, uh, Amy Poehler. She said that if you're into like crafty things, um, people have to make art projects, but she said it's very low competition. <laughs> like it's not like highly, uh, catty or shady or anything like that. So she's, she recommended that. Um, but I was kind of losing my mind today because I went to return my library book and the library now is totally closed as a building and they don't want you to return anything. And it said all books and tapes are now yours until June 1st. And I was like, what will I read? And then I was like, okay, wait, I have an entire book pile of things I need to make it through. Like stop going and getting new things, girl. You have so much on your bookshelf. So I am not hurting for, uh, literature. (laughs) Cool. Well, who, uh, do you think would be interesting for me to talk to on the podcast next? Do you have any, uh, kind of perspective you're interested in hearing someone speak to right now? Gosh, um, you know, I, I guess, um, if you have any nurses or, mm-hmm. or anybody in the healthcare system that is, you know, kind of working this as we go day to day, um, you know, I have a bunch of good friends. My mom again is a nurse, you know, but everybody's experience is kind of different from what I've heard you know, all the healthcare workers that I've talked to, that might be an interesting one, just kind of to know their experience, their stress, like what that all looks like. Um, you know, that I, I, I think that would be interesting. I called my mom today and she, she told me that they're going to get their first confirmed case on her floor. Um, and one of her nurses was on the phone, uh, on, on speakerphone. I could hear, she goes, yeah, let's do this. All excited. And I'm like, what? Are you crazy? Gosh. You know, but that's just a lot of those nurses and, and healthcare workers have that mentality of like, let's tackle this and get it done. Like that's our job. So that might be a really interesting one to kind of totally. put some perspective on. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I give them their time that they need yeah, right now. Absolutely. But I also was like, maybe I'll just uh, t- tell them they don't have to say anything, but like, I'm just going to read them jokes and yeah, <laughs> so some uplifting phrases. Um, yeah, but I have, I have a friend who just finished uh, medical school and she's like, downtime right now because she can't start her new uh residency um so I was like maybe I'll talk to her about yeah that's a great idea how we can support them right now or like what uh healthcare providers want us to actually know other than just wash our hands and stay home which probably the two biggest things well and I'm yeah I'm sure your friend too didn't ever think that the you know as she's gearing up to get into her profession (laughs) pandemic like this would break out you know so just to get perspective on like yeah. Get ready. What's your life going to look like now? You know, that's a huge thing. Most of us don't think about health until it's not well. So for someone who yeah. thinks about health all the time, um, I'm talking to a friend next week who has had uh, a young person who has had chronic health issues and has had to think about that a lot. And so I look forward to hearing what that experience is since it's so different from my own. So. Right. Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, I'm going to wrap this up and say uh, thank you to everyone who listened. And you are beautiful people and you are strong. And uh, I cherish this time when we get to be together. And I hope that this is providing comfort for other people. So thank you, Alexis, for your insight today and your helpful life thank experiences. You. Um, do you want to go ahead and have the final meow? You got it. I want to hear you do it. Me? Okay. <laughs> meow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>